So to begin, we have uh, um, uh, the keynote talk by uh, Daphne Lavalier. <laughs> uh, Daphne is uh, an education, internationally recognised expert on uh, how humans learn, and in particular she studies how the brain adapts to changes in experience, uh, either by nature, for example deafness, or by training, for example playing video games, uh, the focus of uh, today's talk. Initially trained in biology at the École Normale Supérieure de Paris, she then received a PhD in brain and cognitive sciences from MIT and trained in human brain plasticity at the Salk Institute. Uh, Daphne now directs a cognitive neuroscience research team at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, she's a co-founding scientific advisor of Achille Interactive, a company which develops clinically validated cognitive therapeutics that exploit video games a steering committee member on the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Project, New Vision for Education, Unlocking the Potential of Technology, and a member of the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Human Enhancement. We're delighted to welcome Daphne to the talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a big thanks to Derek and the organizing team for allowing me to present our research today. I am a biologist by training. I'm specialized in neuroscience. I never dreamed that my research would one day even be relevant to education. And about 15 years ago, we came across um, a rather surprising finding in the lab. At the time, I was studying brain plasticity from the point of view of studying deafness and how it actually changes how the brain processes information and the implication it may have actually for deaf education. But um, this like, discovery got me to actually a new path. It was a young lab tech um, that actually was playing a lot of action video game. What I'm going to talk about is mostly one genre of video game, which is shoot them up game, first person or third person game. So nothing like what you would think is cognitively enhancing. The type of game we're talking about is this, going after zombies, bad guys, and trying to get to them before they get to you. At the time, it was clearly denounced as a totally inane activity. Um, I'm not a gamer, and you know, we just were working on a study for deafness, and this young lab tech kept telling me, there's a bug in my code, I'm always 100% correct. And we were trying to replicate a study that actually existed in uh, the literature, so we knew what the range of performance should be. So at that point, um, being trained in experimental psychology, I said, stop testing yourself, test naive subjects. He comes back a week later and say, there's still a bug, everybody is 100% correct. I go down to the lab, I test myself, I'm not at 100% correct. I look at him and say, who did you run? He looked at his shoes and acknowledged, well, I ran my friends. And um, it was interesting because then it got us to think, what do you and your friends have in common? And they all belonged to a video game club. I was at the time on the faculty at the University of Rochester in upstate New York, and they were all playing regularly about two hours per day of these uh, action video games, the type I just showed you. So this got us to think, well, if this is a real effect, this is really surprising. We're testing top-down attention, something that we think is important for everyday achievement is hard to harness as actually a lot of implications throughout different fields. And so we went on to a journey, and what I'm going to try to do is to summarize for you basically 17 years of research in the next 25 minutes. Um, so the first thing I want to do is to set up how we proceed in the lab to show these effects. And I'm going to take an example from very basic vision, um, which uh, has to do with one skill that you have all experienced, which is, for example, driving in the fog. When you drive in the fog, everything looks grayish. We're testing your contrast sensitivity, that is your ability to distinguish different levels of gray, to know whether it's a dog crossing in front of you, or whether you're just hallucinating uh, a change in gray level. Now, 
In the lab, we're not asking people to drive in the fog. We're actually sitting them in front of a computer screen and measuring their contrast sensitivity in a rather dull way. And the reason why I'm presenting this here is because that dull way has little in common with playing this kind of action video game I just showed you. But this is exactly what we're after, because we're not after does playing video games get you better at playing video games, but does playing video games gives transfer to other tasks that are not like playing video games. So in this experiment, as a subject, they sit in front of a computer screen, they know that there's going to be a first fixation point, they are supposed to fixate here, then there's two frames with these little um, crosses on the periphery, one, two. In one of these two frames, there's going to be a Gabor patch. Those of you that have good vision may be able to see it right here. Mm. Well, I don't think there's a pointer on it. So right here. Um, and <coughs> if the subjects actually do well, we decrease the amount of contrast, and that's how we measure the threshold for contrast sensitivity. Now, in the first set of experiments, we always proceed by recruiting people that acknowledge they play five hours or more of action video games per week. And then we contrast them to people that don't play much action video games. I'm going to call these people non-video game players, but it's really a misnomer because anyone on a US campus, and I'm sure on a UK campus too, all of those young people do play video games, but they don't play those fast-paced, action-packed video games. They may play puzzle games, they may play um, social uh, simulation games, they may play strategy games, but they play other types of games. And we contrast these two populations. So when we did that for contrast sensitivity, you can see in blue the action video game player and in green the people that don't play those games. And you can see that the people that are in blue have a higher sensitivity, meaning they are better. This would be all fine. This shows that there is a difference between these two populations. But because we're interested in knowing how we can actually induce greater brain plasticity and better learning, what we're really after is to show that these effects can be trained that it's actually the case that I can take any of you here, force you to play an action video game, and get your contrast sensitivity to be better, right? So when we have an effect like that comparing experts versus non-experts, then we go back and we uh, recruit people that play a little bit of video game, casual gamers. Um, we first test here, for example, their contrast sensitivity. Then we randomly assign them to one of two groups. One group which is forced to play action video games, I put a few titles here for you we have used in our studies, and one group which is forced to play control games. Now we have used different types of control games in an effort to understand what are the game mechanics that are important, and we'll get, get back to that at the end of the talk. But all of these control games are commercially available video games that people are ready to pay for, that they dream about, that are very immersive and very engaging. So there is this same um, immersive nature and engaging nature to our experimental games and control games. <coughs> now, we asked people to train uh, early on. They were coming to the lab and actually being paid to play video games in the lab. Now we do training at home. Uh, but the key here is after the end of their training, we wait a few days before testing them, because we're actually interested in long-lasting effects, effects that are durable, not just the fact that if you've played a video game, you may be all charged up, aroused, and that leads to changes in behavior. The other key point here, as you see here, there's different hours of training. They are, like the study I'm going to show you is 50 hours of training, but please, it's not 50 hours in a week. So learning with video game is exactly working under the same rules as any learning. And there's a very rich field of learning showing that small distributed practice is the best way to actually build learning. And that's also the case with video games. So at the start, we started with one hour per day, five days a week over a period of 10 to 12 weeks. Now we're down to about 30 minutes per day, five days a week over a period of um, 
like more or less long depending on which skills you want to change. So we'll see that different skills are more or less plastic. Vision is not very plastic, so you need to go for your 50 hours. So if it's a causal effect of action video games, you predict that people that have been forced to play the action games will show a greater improvement in contrast sensitivity than people that have played the control games. And so that's what I'm going to show you here. This is the amount of improvement in contrast sensitivity. This is measured five days after the end of training. And you can see that playing these action games led to a greater improvement in contrast sensitivity than playing those control games. Now, in this study, we were able to actually follow subjects. So they committed to play the 50 hours, and they committed to stop afterwards. Uh, what's interesting is that you can actually get people to stop. If you're not an action video game player to start with, a lot of people don't actually really enjoy those games. They prefer the games they used to play before. So they keep going to their um, own games. And then we followed these people. We followed them five months later. And then some of them were able to follow for one up to two years. And you can see that the effects get smaller because you have stopped actually training, but it's relatively robust in the face of time. And so that's what I mean, these durable effects. We've been using recently this research in collaboration with uh, Dennis Levy at UC Berkeley to develop software to treat amblyopic patients. I'm happy to tell you more, but it's a little bit outside of the education area. So I'm going to shift back, but if you have questions about that, um, please let me know. So one of the features that really capture our attention is that not only we see improvement in how well you see, but we also see improvement in other aspects of cognition that are not specifically related to how good your vision is. So one example is mental rotation. It's an example from uh, colleagues at the University of Toronto. In this experiment, um, same thing, they took undergraduates and they asked them to do a mental rotation task. It was not a timed task, it was just a pencil and paper task. I'm going to get you to do this task so that you get a good feel for what uh, mental rotation is. Here is your target shape. I'm going to give you four shapes, one, two, three, four. You need to tell me which one is a rotated version of that target shape. So is it one, is it two, is it three, or is it four? I hope you had enough coffee to do it. You need to do that when you do chemistry. You need to do that when you do like mapping. Come on guys, one, two, three, or four? Three, yes, some people have a brain, great. Um, so, but I gave you that because it's a very different feel in terms of tasks and measuring your contrast sensitivity. They used a very similar design to the one I just showed you. They pre-tested everybody on one version of that mental rotation task. Then they randomly assigned the subjects to one of two groups, one that was forced to play an action video game, another that was forced to play a control game, which is really a visual motor um, control game, balance. And then they post-tested after a few days or after a few months, everybody on a different version of that mental rotation task. And the results are schematized here, but they are very similar to ours. There was an improvement in mental rotation after playing 10 hours of these action video games. Again, it's not 10 hours in a day, it's 10 hours over two weeks. It's important because if your children come and tell you, oh, Dr. Bavelier published his good to playing action video games, go and tell them to read the method section. Um, and then they'll discover, oh, well, you know, 30 minutes a day, okay, maybe, and at least like five times a week. After a few months, the effect was still present, and um, the control group didn't show the same effects. So this is very similar, but in a different domain. We are now um, in about 15 years of um, having studied in my lab and other labs the impact of these action video games on different aspects of cognition. And so we're in a position to look at a meta-analysis. This one includes more than 8,000 participants and look at how it impacts different aspects of cognition. The overall effect of playing action video games is about half a standard deviation and beneficial effects on these different aspects of cognition. But as you can see here, some aspects of cognition are actually more improved than others. So 
There is improvement in perception, there is improvement in top-down attention, there is improvement in spatial cognition, and there is improvement in multitasking task switching. The jury is still out for verbal cognition. It um, seems that if there is an effect, it's much, much, much smaller than any other uh, of these other effects. And there's really not enough studies for the other three domains to say what um, is going to happen. But if you know the field of learning, um, this is surprising because it's very rare to get a training which leads to broad transfer of this kind. That happens, but it's relatively rare. That's one of the main challenges in the school, right, is how can I get the students to really understand in depth the concepts so that they can apply them to other situations than exactly the problem set they've been trained on. So that has led us to ask why. What's the mechanism really at play that allows for these game playing to improve performance on these different aspects of cognition? So I'm now going to argue for something which is not very um, common um, in the literature and especially in the media, is for the fact that at least when it comes to these action video games, they have a very potent effect on top-down attention, attentional control. There's almost every week some report in the media that technology use and internet use is leading to ADD and ADHD and attentional problems. Here I'm telling you the opposite because we have actually measured it in the lab. Now we'll come back to that at the end and see that different technology may have very different effects on the brain and so that's maybe where some of the confusion is coming from. Here, I'm just going to present one study, but we did many. It's um, the test of variables of attention. It's often used for diagnostic of attentional skills uh, in children and adults. It's a very, very simple task. You're seated in front of a computer screen. If the square is presented on top of the screen, please press a key. If it's presented at the bottom of the screen, withhold your response. Here you can see that there are many key presses. It's the impulsivity condition. It's basically how good you are at stopping yourself when you're in go mode. The other condition is a sustained attention condition, which is a little bit what you're doing right now, listening, it's boring, nothing happens, and suddenly I point to you and you're like, oh, what's going on? Uh, but that's exactly the point. So most of the time you do nothing, and from time to time there's a square at the top of the screen and you need to press. Um, we know reaction times are going to be longer in the sustained attention condition than in the impulsivity condition. And that's what you're seeing here. The sustained attention condition gives longer reaction time than the impulsivity condition. But you can also see that those people, and these are young adults, that are action video game players are actually faster than those that are not. So you could tell me, uh, duh, like, you know, we know these guys are trigger happy. They are playing video game, they want to go for the button, they are very impulsive. But what's been very interesting in this study and other studies is that we can actually measure the accuracy. And when we look at uh, accuracy, there is actually no trade-off. That is that they are as accurate as the people that don't play those action video games, but they are faster. They are about faster by 10 to 12 percent on a range of reaction time. We have tested between um, very fast reaction time, like 300 milliseconds, all the way to um, one second and more. So if you step back, clearly they're not more impulsive. They seem to have better sustained attention, if anything. And in fact, it really means these people can make more correct decisions per unit of time. It's interesting that totally independently from our work, there's a group at Beth Israel in Boston that um, was training laparoscopic surgeons. And in 2005, they published a study showing that the young surgeons in training that reported playing video games, and in particular action video games, were better surgeons than the most seasoned surgeons on the team because they were faster and didn't make more errors. And so this has led to a program of research that is looking at how to leverage um, 
video game playing and different type of video game playing for training aspect of laparoscopic surgery. And interestingly, if you're like interested in that, it actually helps on some of the laparoscopic skills and others that are highly specialized and that require expertise, like tying a knot, it doesn't help. So there's definitively um, like specificity in the kind of effects. Now to step back, I showed you one example of uh, better attention. We have many, many different studies. This is Sean Green, um, actually the young lab assistant who is now not that young, he's now tenured at Wisconsin, um, that made the discovery thanks to his friend and him playing a lot of Unreal Tournament. We have many, many different studies showing that there is improvement in what we call attention and attentional control, whether it's deployed to object, deployed in space, deployed in time. And we have been going to ask what are the neural basis of these effects, what, what really changes um, in terms of the neural systems that mediate um, top-down attention. So I'm going to briefly present to you one fMRI study, which um, we used a paradigm that is used a lot in cognitive neuroscience to study top-down attention. It's a rather boring paradigm. It was developed by Posner and collaborator. You hear a cue, you have to orient your attention to one location, right or left. You wait. And then eventually, there are going to be stimuli appearing. Now, there's two stimuli appearing, but only one of these is actually a Gabor patch, so a little like orientation patch. The other one is just noise. Your task is to say whether the Gabor patch is tilted up or down. This is hard. You need to maintain attention like that for about an hour and a half on that rather boring uh, task. And so, it's a task which is known to recruit very efficiently um, this attentional control network system that has been described in the literature, which involves frontal areas, parietal areas, and the cingulate that are working together to both control goal-directed attention, so like paying attention to what my goal is and maintaining my goal, and at the same time being able to break that circuit so when new information comes in that I should really pay attention to that is, was not part of my goal. Um, the first uh, main result is that during target processing, so when those targets come in, we actually see a greater activation for people that are action video game player than for people that are non-action video game player. Um, and interestingly, the more the activation in action video game player, the better their performance. So this is something that you may not know, but very often the harder the tasks, the more activation. So that means the worse your performance, the more activation. Here, this is the opposite relationship that we actually see in action video game players. The one that recruit more efficiently that uh, attentional <coughs> system show greater um, performance. The other interesting feature is during the queue, as people wait and prepare for the task, we find um, the opposite as during target processing. That is that people that tend to have very low activation that are like not um, really summoning those attentional system and getting them to work ahead of the task do better. And this is especially true in action video game players, but we also see it in non-video game players. So there is a sense in which if um, your attention is rather automatic, you don't want to prepare too early. You want to actually prepare and use your resources when they are needed at the time of target processing and keep the system in um, this very low expectancy state um, during target preparation. This is a feature of automaticity. So when something, when a task becomes relatively automatic, we see lesser activation in uh, these frontal areas. And this is something that we see here. So one way of interpreting the data I've shown you is that as you play action video game, the ability to distribute attention in a top-down way becomes more and more automatic. Okay. By the way, if you have questions, I'm more than happy to entertain them while I'm talking. Not while I'm talking, but we can take a break. <laughs> so here I have um, told you that action video gameplay enhances top-down attentional control. 
This is true in young adults who also have studies in children, seven to 17 years old. In children, we don't do training study because as you probably realize, most of these action games are actually violent. So we just go to schools and we do surveys. And you'll be surprised to know that, well, you probably won't be surprised. A lot of parents are surprised by the difference between what their kids report and what they report. We actually don't tell each person what is the difference, but there is quite a bit of misalignment between what the parents think their children do and what actually the children do. So there's some value in talking to the children. You guys know that as educators. Um, but we see that those children that report playing action video games have um, much better performance in terms of top-down attention than those that do not. We also have this series of experiments that show that um, as a result of this enhanced attentional control, these action gamers are better at selecting what is task relevant, important for their task, and what is source of noise or distraction that they should ignore. And um, thanks to this increased signal to noise ratio that allows them to make more informed decision. I'm now going to do the next step. The next step is that if you are confronted with a new task, with something you have never seen before, being able to actually extract what's relevant for performing well at this task faster is the stepping stone to learning. And so the prediction is that these individuals should be better learners. So we have tested that in um, a number of domains, um, you will see where we're staying relatively low level. One is perceptual learning. So again, it's in the domain of vision. You have to uh, decide whether that Gabor patch is tilted left or tilted right. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. We present participants with Gabor like these, and they have to decide whether it's tilted left or right from a minus 35 degree reference angle. Now, it's not because um, we are uh, crazy and we think everybody knows what a 35, minus 35 degree reference angle is, but it's because we want them to learn. So they don't know. If you're not a vision scientist, you don't know whether this is still left or right, but we give you feedback. And as we give you feedback, you actually learn. As you learn, we actually decrease the amount of contrast in the display. So here, the least contrast, the better your performance. This is a task we use because it is a very rich field called perceptual learning, where this task has been used over and over again. We know its dynamics. Uh, it's been very well characterized. This is the curve of learning over uh, eight sessions that are performed over like two days, four sessions per day, in non-video game players. And you can see that they are slowly reducing the contrast, which is a signal that their visual system is learning. Now, this is the same task in people that are playing action video game. You can see that they are starting similarly, but they show a great, um, like a much faster improvement in their perceptual learning. So this is again gamer and non-gamer. The issue is can you train this um, skill? So same design as what I showed you before. We pre-tested subjects on a perceptual learning task they had never done before. We randomly assign them to one of two groups, and then we post them on a different learning task, because you can't, once you have learned something, you have learned something, so we need a new learning task. And the prediction is that those action gamers shouldn't, um, should show greater learning improvement from pre to post than those control gamers. So what I'm going to show you is indeed, before people have been actually assigned to playing their video games, there's no difference in the perceptual learning capacities of these people. After they have been forced to play their 45 hours of action game or their 45 hours of control game, you can see that those that have played the action game learn faster. Um, so it's just a replication, but showing that we can causally induce that by forcing people to play those action games. Now, this is an example from vision, it's relatively low level. You know, is it going to be scaling up into more cognitive tasks, to tasks that are requiring working memories, that are requiring manipulating um, more um, cognitive knowledge? So 
we ask that question by using a task which is very demanding on um, actually the executive functions. It's called a dual and back task. This is a hellish task. I'm not going to get you to do it, but I want you to get a feel for it. Um, so as a participant, you have headphones and you're watching a screen. In the headphones, you hear a stream of letter, P, C, C, K. On the screen, at the same time, you see a square at different location. Your task as a subject, if it's a one back task, is to say whether a letter repeated and to say whether a square repeated location. These may or may not happen at the same time. They are totally uncorrelated with each other. So you have to monitor both visually and auditorily these two different streams. That's a one back task. But as a two back task, you now have to say whether, for example, that C that is coming here was present two times before and whether that square that was presented here was at the same location two times before, okay? So that means that you actually need to keep in working memory those representations that were here before, and then you need to refresh them as you get new items, so it's very demanding on the executive function. We use this task, as Susan Yegi and John Janaitis had shown that actually young uh, adults can learn this task and we ad like, use an adaptive procedure to start them at a one back and then we graduate them to a two back and then we graduate them to a three back depending on how fast they actually learn. So this adaptive procedure allows us to monitor their performance. Exactly the same design as before, it's actually the same subjects that did both the perceptual learning and this and back task learning. Before training, we checked that the two populations were not different in executive function using another end back task, not a dual one, a single one with shapes that they will never see afterwards. And the two groups were similar. After training for 45 hours, we can see that the people that were trained with the control games do learn, but they learn much more slowly than the ones that were trained with the action games. Here on the y-axis is the level of end back. So the bigger the better. Once you're at four back, that means you can actually go four steps back and uh, maintain that performance at 80% correct. Now I told you that our hypothesis was that better attentional control was linked to this better learning. So we have actually another step um, that we wanted to check is that if we measured the attentional control of participants before they did all these learning tasks as post-test, this would predict their capacity to actually learn. And the hypothesis is not linked to action or non-action video game. The hypothesis is your capacity right now in terms of attention control is determining your learning. And so these are all the subjects together, measuring attention with the task that we have been using over and over in the lab, which is a complicated task that taps both attention control and executive function. But you can see that there is a relationship for both types of learning, whether it's perceptual learning or cognitive learning, between the amount of attention control a participant has and how much learning they actually show on the task. So here we call that learning to learn because in a sense we force them to play action video games, we boost their attention control, and as a result of boosting their attention control, they show better learning on other tasks. We have been able to show that in the domain of perceptual learning, visual motor control learning, cognitive learning as I showed you. We're lo looking at how far we can go with uh, miniature statistical language learning, which is very different from playing those games. We don't know, like the jury is still out. Um, there is one Big question, we have very good evidence that these participants that play action video games are very good when it comes to controlling what is of interest in their environment and suppressing sources of distraction or noise from the environment. We don't know at all whether it would generalize to problem solving and reasoning, which has to do with controlling what's relevant in your memory store, selecting what's important for the task at hand, and suppressing those memory representations that are irrelevant for problem solving. So this is an area right now which um, is basically left uncharted, where we're beginning to venture, but uh, we don't have data yet. Um, I want to quickly go over the game factors that are important for learning. And, um, 
There is a number of features of gaming that are really good for learning that are, we call, enabling factors that are common to all video games. Video games are very, very good learning tools. They have rediscovered a lot of the tenets of the learning literature. It's actually amazing how pressure from the market has led game designers to rediscover these main principles. Um, but there are some action factors. As I told you in our hands, action video games don't have exactly the same effects as other games. And some of these action factors have to do with pacing, so the need to make decisions under time constraints. Doesn't mean that it has to be very fast, just has to feel fast to your participants, so it will be a very slow game for an older adult compared to a very fast game for a 20-year-old. The need for distributed attention and the need for the constant shift between very focused attention and very distributed attention. And that's one of the things that these action video games do very well. You have to aim, you have to aim appropriately, so that requires very focused attention. And then you have to monitor your environment for many different other objects of interest, so that's very distributed attention. Um, I'm seeing it's 10.15, so I'm probably going to leave you with that, but I'm happy to discuss why there is so much confusion about technology and academic and work performance in the question. Thank you very much, and I want to actually thank the people that did a lot of the work, uh, my students, postdocs, and collaborators. Thank you so much.